At first glance, sails seem pretty straightforward. You've got a ship, a mast goes up, and a canvas is spread out to catch the wind. The wind pushes the canvas and the ship moves forward. Simple enough, mm -hmm. right? But what happens when the wind isn't coming from directly behind the ship? What if it's coming from directly ahead? Can the ship still move forward then? It's the age before engines, before GPS, before even reliable maps. For early sailors, the wind wasn't just a force of nature. It was a highway, and its direction was the only map they had. For centuries, the limits of wind determined where people could go, when they could travel, and whether entire civilizations could even meet. If they were travelling in the same direction as the wind is blowing, or downwind as it's known, they could cover incredible distances for trading or exploring new lands. But if their goal lay in the opposite direction, upwind, then unless you were as skilled as Roman sailors who figured out how to zigzag using square sails as far back as the 5th century BCE, your choices were limited. You had to wait for a change in weather, row until exhausted, or simply give up. Everything started to change with one game-changing invention. The triangular lateen sail. First developed in the second century CE, probably by Greek and Roman shipbuilders, but most prominently found on Arab dhows cruising across the Indian Ocean, what made this sail revolutionary was its shape and its rigging. Unlike square sails that mainly catch wind blowing from behind, the triangular lateen sail is mounted at an angle on a long, slanted spar called a yard, running diagonally across the mast. This setup allows the sail to be trimmed, or adjusted, much more freely, so it can slice into the wind at sharp angles. And, by the way, it's always great to know how things actually work. Because what if we suddenly lost everything like power, internet, and even clean water? How much could we rebuild from scratch? The answers are in the book. The ultimate guide to rebuilding a civilization. And it's today's sponsor. But we'll talk about them later in the video. So now, imagine you're on a sailboat and the wind is blowing from say, this random direction. To move forward, you'd angle your sail like this. What's really happening here is that the sail isn't just a flat board catching wind. It's shaped and positioned so that it splits the airflow. Some air flows along the shorter, flatter side of the sail, the inside, while the rest follows a longer, curved path around the leeward, the outside. Because this curve route takes longer, the air on the outside must speed up to meet the air travelling the shorter path at the back edge of the sail. This is Bernoulli's principle in action. When air moves faster, its pressure drops. So the pressure on the outside of the sail is lower than on the inside. This pressure difference creates a force that pulls the sail toward the lower pressure side. It's the same trick that keeps airplanes in the sky. Lift is the technical name for this force. But there's a catch. This lift doesn't push you exactly in the direction you want to go. Instead, the force acts almost at a right angle to the wind's direction. If you've ever flown a kite, you've seen this in action. The string pulls you sideways and slightly forward, not straight downwind. So how does a sailboat end up moving forward, and not just sliding off to the side? Here's the clever part. You can break that angled force into two components using basic physics. One part points along the length of the boat, forward, and the other points sideways, perpendicular. The forward part is what actually pushes your boat ahead. The sideways part tries to push your boat downwind. You want to maximize the forward push and minimize the sideways slip. This is where the engineering of the hull comes in. The hull is carefully shaped. 
long and narrow underneath with smooth sides so it slices through the water in the forward direction, but resists being pushed sideways. Think of the difference between sliding a sled straight downhill, easy, versus trying to shove it sideways across the hill, much harder. On a boat is called lateral resistance. The water acts like a grip holding the boat's path steady and leaving most of the wind's lift to propel you forward. However, hull shape alone isn't always enough, especially on smaller or lighter boats. If the boat is too round, too shallow, or has a flat bottom, it doesn't grip the water as much, and the sideways force from the sail can cause the whole boat to slip sideways, a phenomenon called leeway. This sideways sliding wastes energy and makes steering much harder, especially when trying to sail upwind. That's why almost all sailboats have a keel, a long, thin, vertical fin that hangs down beneath the hull. The keel acts like the deep blade of an ice skate. It pushes against the water and stops the boat from sliding sideways. The deeper and heavier the keel, the more it resists sideways movement and helps the boat track straight, even when the wind tries to shove it off course. On modern boats, the keel is often shaped like an underwater wing, creating even more lift in the right direction. But even with a good keel, some sideways slip will still happen. Another thing you'll notice is that as the boat sails upwind, it tends to tip or heel over to one side. This happens because the force from the wind, pulling at the top of the mast and sail, acts far above the water, while the resistance from the hull and keel comes from below. It wants to tip over. This creates a torque, a turning force, that tries to knock the boat down. If the wind gets strong enough and the boat isn't designed to handle it, this torque can even capsize the boat. To balance things out, boat designers often add extra weight to the bottom of the keel, sometimes hundreds or thousands of kilograms of lead or iron. This weight, called ballast, acts like a counterweight. The heavier and lower the ballast, the harder it is for the wind to tip the boat over, keeping the hull upright and the sails working efficiently. On some high-speed performance boats, designers use a bulb keel, a torpedo-shaped weight at the very bottom, to get the best stability with the least extra drag. While sailing, you're always tuning and adjusting changing the sail angle, shifting your weight, or tweaking the rudder based on the wind's direction and strength. The better you feel the changes in the wind, the more smoothly and efficiently you'll move. Even expert sailors never stop learning how to balance all these forces. And that whole process, breaking things down, making small adjustments, and solving problems step by step, is exactly what this book achieves. It fundamentally answers the question we've asked more than once on this channel, how things work. The book, The Ultimate Guide to Rebuilding a Civilization, is exactly that. A survival manual, a blueprint, and a time capsule of practical knowledge. From growing food and purifying water, to forging tools and building machines, it teaches you the world from first principles. We've already been learning about how ships work, how they float, how they move, how and why they are built, but this book zooms out to the entire human project. It wasn't just beautiful, it was useful. The book even hides a secret quest, a real puzzle-filled journey woven into the illustrations. Riddles, symbols, hidden clues, it's all there. No walkthroughs, no hints, just you, your curiosity, and whatever you can uncover. If this book sounds like something you need your hands on, don't wait. Use our code NAVIGATION10 for 10% off and grab your copy from the link below. Now, back to sailing. In 2012, a sailing craft called Vestas Sail Rocket hit a top speed of 68 knots. At that time, the wind was only around 25 knots. That means the boat was moving 2.7 times faster than the true wind which is the real wind speed in the environment. 
But that's not what you feel on the boat. What you feel is called apparent wind, and it depends on both the true wind and how fast you're moving. Let's say the wind is coming from the side at 8 knots, and your boat is also moving forward at 8 knots. The wind won't feel like it's coming straight from the side anymore. Instead, it'll seem like it's coming from a roughly a 45 degree angle ahead. The result is a new wind direction and a wind speed stronger than the actual wind. In fact, when you adjust the angle of the sail, you're doing it based on the apparent wind you feel, and not the true wind. Well, these advanced sailboats can sail at an angle very close to the wind because they're built with advanced aerodynamic and hydrodynamic design. Your boat probably can't do that. If the wind is coming from a direction too close to where you want to go, you simply can't move forward because of what's called a no-go zone. Let's say the wind is coming from this direction, just slightly off straight ahead. You angle your sail like this, and the resulting force points here. If you break that force into two parts, forward thrust and sideways force, You'll notice that most of it pushes you sideways, with barely any forward thrust. It's not enough to move you forward. There is a range of wind angles where your boat just won't move forward, no matter how you angle your sail, and it's called the no-go zone. For a typical boat, it's about 45 degrees on either side of the bow. When the wind comes from within this zone, you need a special technique to sail ahead. First, you point your boat just outside the no-go zone. Then, you move forward using the aerofoil method we talked about earlier. Once you've gained enough speed, you turn the boat to the other side, adjust your sail, and continue. After you've gained enough speed, turn to the other side again. By repeating this zigzag motion, called tacking, you can make steady progress into the wind. And just like that, you can sail anywhere you want, regardless of the wind's direction, even if your destination lies straight upwind. Because sailors could zigzag or tack much closer into the wind, the invention of the Lantine sail turned what used to be a one-way street into a two-way highway. European explorers quickly picked up on this idea and made their own tweaks, adding different rigs and hull shapes. By the age of discovery, sailing upwind was essential for reaching the Americas, going round Africa and opening up the world's sea lanes. Inventing the latine transformed the wind from an obstacle into a powerful, flexible tool and opened up entire new worlds for anyone brave enough to use it. Think of Christopher Columbus who not only sailed with the trade winds to the new world, but had to beat his way back home against the same wind. An impossible journey with square sails alone. As shipbuilders and sailors grew bolder, ships became faster and more specialised. By the 19th century, the legendary clipper ships had arrived. Sleek, towering vessels with vast expanses of sail built to chase the wind and race from China to London or Australia to San Francisco. Clippers were marvels of upwind sailing, their crews famous for beating against storms to deliver tea, wool or gold in record time. For these ships, upwind performance wasn't just about speed, it was about survival reputation, and sometimes even the difference between profit and loss for entire trading companies. Throughout history, mastering the art of sailing upwind was more than just a commercial advantage. It was often a matter of military dominance and national security. Naval battles in the Age of Sail, such as the clashes between the British Royal Navy and the Spanish Armada in 1588, or the great conflicts of the Napoleonic era, were frequently decided not by sheer firepower, but by which fleet could manoeuvre upwind more effectively. Commanders who understood how to gain the weather gauge, positioning their ships upwind of the enemy, held a decisive advantage allowing them to control the engagement and choose when 
and how to strike. Although, to be honest, having the best cannons didn't hurt either. Upwind sailing's importance didn't fade with the age of steam. It evolved. In the 20th century, competitive sailing became the proving ground for every new upwind technique. The very first Olympic sailing events, held in 1900, challenged crews to outsmart wind and water, making tacking and sail trim essential skills. And nowhere has upwind prowess been more critical or more celebrated than in the America's Cup, the oldest trophy in international sport. Countless cup matches have been won or lost on the upwind legs, where the right sail setting, clever navigation and even a single timely tack could snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Today, this spirit is coming back in a new way. Modern yachts, made from lightweight carbon fibre with tall, narrow sails and packed with sensors, can sail closer to the wind than ever before. Cargo ships and ferries are starting to use wind power again, but with modern technology. For example, some ships now have huge, tall sails made from strong materials or use special spinning columns called Flettner rotors that work like vertical airplane wings to help push the ship. Others use giant kites, like huge parachutes, to catch the wind high above the ocean. These systems help big ships save fuel and reduce pollution. Just in the last few years, some of the world's biggest cargo ships and tankers have crossed oceans with the help of these wind-assisted devices, proving that even in the age of engines, wind can still play an important role. The challenge remains as exciting as ever, turning the wind, which often tries to slow you down, into the very thing that pushes you forward. Every time a sailor zigzags up a narrow channel, or two racing yachts fight for position against the wind, they're following in the footsteps of explorers, traders and dreamers. People who once looked at the wind and wondered, how far can we go if we're brave enough to sail against it? <laughs>